supply of consistent, good quality, safe food that's uh, readily available in our supermarkets every day. Australian policies at the moment are doing everything they can to contract our food producing areas, only so that we then, the average Australian then will have to buy from overseas and it's, it's quite bizarre. We've sort of followed on in our father's footsteps to a degree, but as my dad said, and as a lot of the older generations say, hey listen, this, you're only there for a period of time. Now, you might say you own the land, you never own the land. The simple fact is you're a custodian of it, and when you leave that, it's got to be better than when you first got there. And that's what my dad did when he took it over from my grandfather, and same thing here. This is basically uh, broad-scale flood irrigation. It's a drainage recycling system. Uh, we water from the top of the bays, down the, down the fall of the country, pick it up at the bottom and then take it back and recycle it. So all water's kept on farm, all drainage water, and reused. Behind me you can see a, um, a 10 kilowatt tracker. It's cutting edge technology. We have other solar panels on the, on the farm as well and uh, we aim to get to uh, a state where we are totally self-sufficient with our energy use. Managing water is a very complex issue that requires a large degree of local knowledge. So a manager from Darwin would probably not know how to manage water in Victoria. And so the managers who are effective this have learnt uh, it's, a, it's a dirt under the skin type of business. It's not that I went to Harvard University, now I can manage it. And so it's an apprenticeship process. And in the federal government, they've never done this. One of the things we've tried to say to them, to the authority and to the politicians, is that don't underestimate the wealth of wisdom and experience in these communities. I mean, if they came to us and asked us our advice, um, they would get a lot of knowledge because there's a huge amount of knowledge stored here that's, you know, if you added it up, it'd be hundreds of years of knowledge. And you only get that by experience. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority will now spend the next 20 weeks consulting communities. There's been very little consultation whatsoever, and the consultation that came through this reach was basically lecturing at us, telling us what they thought they were going to do and how they were going to do it. And the word negotiate has been superimposed with compulsories. They put out this beautiful glossy brochure, putting environmental issues um, in front of families, people, human beings. It omitted to have anything at all to do with the human cost. You know, they might say something to you privately and then you hear them say at a meeting, you know, in a couple of months' time to a different audience, they'll say exactly the opposite and you think, well, why do I bother? But we are going to bother and we are going to just keep keep trying to get the best result that we can possibly get. This issue has um, been so profound in the community's uh, concern of its impact that there has been an, a resolute unity. And not only in the Murray Group of Concerned Communities, but right across the basin. Yeah, look, one of the concerns that um, we had as a local community, uh, especially as far as resource management goes, is that the, uh, the powers to be just aren't taking any notice of the, um, of the locals that have got a bit of knowledge in the area that, that actually work with the environment. Locals are now wondering if there are any live fish left in the Warkool River between Barham and Swan Hill. Thousands suffocated when floodwaters from the Murray River, which turn black and toxic in wetlands, flowed into the Warkool system removing oxygen from the water. Locals say they pleaded with the Murray-Darling Basin Authority to quickly release some of its environmental water, but instead it waited until it was too late. The MDBA have got a huge parcel of environmental water there already, and um, the simple fact was nobody was prepared to release it. That there's a, a black water event, that's what you actually see when the water um, actually does turn black. There's all the leaf litter on the side. There was just some of the holes that were just a complete mass of native fish. You know, we had just piles of them, and it was just so devastating to actually see, and we're worried that, that these unusual occurrences will become a, um, something that we we're gonna have to put up with regularly. These farmers believe the fish kill is another example of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority being out of its depth and failing to listen to locals. Spectacular, jaw-dropping, powerful. Incredible.
The work we did when we came to the Coorong was to look at what its natural character was. This is part of the Ramsar process, but also part of its management, because to understand where it's come from informs where it's effectively heading to. So on a windy February, a field team and I set out to core the full length of the Coorong, and we cored 30 sites from near the mouth right the way down past Salt Creek. And we brought up evidence for the history of the Coorong over six or 7,000 years from its full length. And one of the most remarkable things for me in terms of unearthing this history was the sediments at the top were soft and black like soft butter, full of smelly sulphide. And that was in complete contrast to the sediments below, which were full of marl and shell, showing an active tidal estuarine system. So the salinity that's characterised by the Ramsar Coorong is actually an artefact of river regulation and the barrages. The natural ecological character of the Coorong for its full length right the way through Salt Creek is a dynamic estuary. Uh, it's been blocked up at all ends. It's now becoming a stagnant lagoon. Freshwater flows to the southern end of the Coorong historically came from the southeast of South Australia, not the Murray River. Over the last century, much of the southeast had its wetlands drained to reclaim areas for agriculture. Natural fresh water that previously flowed to the Coorong was diverted out to sea. These man-made drainage systems had a fundamental impact on the ecology of the Coorong. Lake Alexandrina has an estuarine history, more so to the south near the mouth, but even to the north, there is some evidence of tidal water penetrating right the way up towards where the Murray itself empties into the lake. As Captain Sturt sailed into Lake Alexandrina, he reported that the river was sweet to drink. But as he continued south, he found that the water quickly turned salty and unpalatable. There was a lot of salt water that mixed right back in through these areas. And you know, there's been recordings through fossilizations and science right back as far as up to Nildotti, um, where they found you know, dolphins fossilised in, in the limestone up there. And it's, it's quite amazing, the history. And, and the, when the salt water did influx back that far into the system, you did have a lot of this fish of the sea coming into these areas and spawning and different breeding events and so forth. And, and, and that was the ecology of the system. This had the biodiversity was really rich and you know, diversified at that time. And then you'd have the big influx of the waters coming down through the wet seasons and push all that salt back out and flush the system and clean it and filter it. And, and it was a healthy system. During the construction of the Goolwa Barrage, which was the last barrage to be built, it was quite uh, noticeable that this was the last bastion for some of those larger fish like the Mulloway and, uh, and perhaps the smaller fish like the mullet as well where they had a barrier they couldn't get through into the lower lakes to breed and to live and to move about and, and use it as a resting point, as a lot of fish species do. And so what happened was the Mulloway, you know, the actual breeding cycles of the Mulloway require that, that movement from estuarine water to seawater uh, and, and back again and so on. And so there was a huge uh, Mulloway industry around Malang and, and in the main body of the lake, huge tonnages of, of, of fish taken out. We're talking about thousands of fish at that, at that stage trying to enter the system and uh, for the last time they couldn't uh, because of the barrages. Of course we've seen a diminishing of that species ever since. And Bird Island is in fact a, a product of man's folly because simply we have not allowed the system to, to operate as it should in a natural sense. And it probably contains something like a million tonnes of sand that shouldn't be there. For the last 70 years, sand on the ocean side of the barrages has progressively built up and become a fully vegetated island. Bird Island is now impeding flows to the Coorong and Murray Mouth. Environmental flows aim to use fresh water to scour out the Murray Mouth, a task previously achieved by seawater tidal flows. Everything is and Queensland have toured the state's Coorong and Lower Lakes amid concern about the Murray-Darling Basin draft plan. Their position is based on other factors that I say are self-interest factors, more so than the position that South Australia has adopted. We look through it from a Victorian point of view, which is where what I'm saying is there needs to be balance. 
Although salt levels in the Murray River are low, the Basin Plan sets new salinity targets in Lake Alexandrina. Retired scientist Ian Rowan has been monitoring telemetry beacons which measure salinity levels in EC units. The data he has observed raises questions about the ability to achieve such low salinity levels in the lakes. Well, at the moment, the locks have to be, or some of the locks have to be open. Uh, we've got a flow of about 40 gigalitres a day flowing out to sea. So you have to expel that water. But even uh, last night's storm has produced uh, saline intrusions from the mouth to Tewitchery and uh, Ewer Island. And at the moment, the uh, conductivity has uh, risen from less than 1,000 to about 12,000 EC units upstream of Tewitchery Barrage. So um, you can sort of see just a minor effect of the wind without the tides uh, produces these saline intrusions. The beacons show that when the Tawitchery Barrage opens to expel fresh water from the lakes, seawater moves back into the lake and reaches as far as Point Sturt within 24 hours. A few days later, it reaches Pomander Point, then travels down the channel to Clayton. Seawater from Clayton flows around Hindmarsh Island and out of the Goulwa Barrage. During southerly swells, seawater intrusions are also common when the Goulwa Barrage is open. It's quite interesting to watch um, the, uh, the salt water intruding up past these, uh, these beacons. We were surprised first off that they even got a, you know, uh, upstream of the barrages, especially as we've had sort of flood conditions basically for the last two years. And then to see them go further up and, um, and right up into the lakes, when you're sort of talking about these intrusions against flows of um, 30, 50, 70 gigalitres a day, um, that is a surprise. It's going to become problematic as sea levels rise with global warming and so on because already at high tides they have overflows. Right now with this wind there would be, along with the normal high tide, there would be a storm surge which would lift the level even higher. And so with any gates open at all, and they have a lot open at the moment because uh, the river's hot running strongly, even against those strong flows you're going to get water, saline water, salinity moving back into the lake, that at estuarine situation. But there's a clear risk that we're looking at a metre sea level rise this century. What you're going to have is a perennial challenge of dealing with uh, higher seas and sea surges into the barrage system. A permanent rise of that amount um, will have a significant effect on, um, on the lower lakes and it make it very, very difficult to keep them fresh. The lower lakes and Coorong struggled to survive during the millennium drought resulting in demands for further environmental freshwater flows. Just how bad was the drought? Yeah, it looked a lot different out there three years ago when, uh, in the middle of the drought, uh, there was just no water. The uh, lake levels at that time were almost two metres below what they are now. And so, uh, from the exposed lake beds out there, we had acidic dust storms uh, blowing towards our new galvanised iron house. The last couple of years of the drought, we got to the stage where the jetties behind me here, we could walk around under them, so there were no, basically no boats in this marina, a couple on the very outside. Um, there were, the river behind us was a channel, a, a narrow little strip of water with huge beaches either side of it, and so it got to the stage where boating was basically not possible. And that started to have a serious effect on the economy and, and tourism. This whole region relies enormously on tourism. The problem with allowing salt water in to this area is that surrounding the lakes and, and the lower part of the river here, you have got agriculture and infrastructure that depends on that water. Certainly in the past, uh, a lot of the big irrigators were reliant on this water. Now, now they've got pumps and pipelines from Tail and Bend. As soon as the drought came, the politicians sort of said, yes, it's got to be fresh in the future. And that's it, and we're sort of stuck with that. The proposed plan was probably born out of the wrong motivation because they assessed the health of the basin in the middle of a 10-year drought. And if you assess anything when it's sick or when it's undersupplied, of course you're going to come up with a result of it needs more water. I mean, everybody knows that it needs more water in the middle of a drought. Now we have this plan based on a false assumption. So let's face it, if there's no water in the system anymore to manage, then the basin plan and the, um, the allocations that they're talking about up there are irrelevant to what happens here. 
but it seems to me there's been an environmental sort of uh, ideology